they're finally back! Hey guys, it's CL, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I make brand new Critical Role recaps every Monday at noon, and would be happy to have you join the party. If you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe and hit the Bertrand bell to be notified of future videos. Now, without further ado, let's discuss the 64th episode of Campaign 3 of Critical Role. The episode opens as the wild mount half of Bell's Hells begin to get stuck in a loop of teleportation pain. The running bit for the night is that Laura is rolling like shit, and her initial roll at the end of the last episode that they appeared in was a 5, and that causes them to take 18 points of damage. Then she rolls a 4, making them take another 15 points of damage, which is insane because how on a D100 do you roll a 4 and a 5? I'm afraid that if they had taken another round of damage, Imogen may have just been like dead, knocked out. But she rolls a 13 on her third try and ends up sending them to a cliffside with homes built into the side of the stone. They look around and Frida is able to deduce that they're near the Flockette Alps in Wildmount. Yeah, they didn't get very far from Uthadurn now, did they? They do notice a large group of Aarakocra flying towards them, and we find out that they landed in a hidden tribe of them, and the guard begin rounding the party up and demanding to know where they came from and how they found them. A series of persuasion checks ensue to try and convince them to back down, and FCG begins to snap under the pressure after giving out a guidance spell. Deanna tries to divine intervention the anger away, but it fails and the party are blindfolded and bagged and brought far away from the village to maintain its secrecy. Imogen casts calm emotions on FCG until he's able to make a wisdom save to fight off the anger, and they try to divine intervention to teleport them to Marquette, which also doesn't work. Instead, they decide to rest for the day so the staff can regain enough charges to teleport them to Drusar. That night, FCG goes into stasis, and Frida decides to delve into their dreams. Inside, they find a non-removable point of rage, an intent to kill, to cleanse. They also see someone building them, hands assembling and carving and enchanting them. Christian asks the DM if it's like a virus, and sadly doesn't roll high enough to ascertain whether it can be fixed or changed. I love having him at the table as Frida. He brings such a calm intellect that I really enjoy, and I'm gonna miss. The next morning, a 53 is rolled, and that takes them to the city of Drusar. They head to the definitely not called Sit and Spin, and check in with Pretty as to whether or not he's seen their friends. Though he hasn't, Deanna creepily fixes Pretty's PJs. They actually bond over her garment making, and she gives him a handkerchief. I love Pretty. And also, Frida's disbelief that Pretty turned down Fern and Imogen made me cackle. They decide to make their way to the Spire by Fire and notice the magic has been affected here just like it was in Uthadurn. Oh yeah, I should probably mention that the Red Moon Ruidus is hanging ominously in a flared state, permanently affixed to a single beam of light. The city has also been overrun with skyships and many different militaries. Sure, the Quorum has a large amount, but people from Tal'Dorei and Wildmount also seem to be showing their spread of military might. Using their letter from the King and Queen of Uthadurn to get them across to the center spire, Fern transforms into a tanuki to make more room on the magic platform thingy as they're sent across, and ends up using that form to eavesdrop on a convo between some well-established looking military generals. And it seems like they're being kept in the dark as to what's going on, but their tone is very serious. Bell's Hells buys them some drinks as they're about to head out and march down to the site. I'm worried. With how powerful lewdness is, it might just be a death march. I need to be extremely honest here. I kind of dozed off. So after break, I only woke up just as the Asilra half of Bell's Hells arrived at the Spire by Fire. Please forgive me. But yay, the party is back together. FCG gets extremely jealous when seeing Imogen hug Frida and they call her a hussy, which made me really laugh. And the group are charmed to meet Bell's Hell's new friend, One Punch Grim Poppy, aka Prism, who entails killing Bordor with one punch. I love that she just begins making up a random reputation for herself, and nobody except FCG really believes her. While the Asilra half recount their adventures with the Dawn Father, 
Deanna becomes kind of triggered at hearing about the death of an angel, and she dismisses herself while they talk. She ends up communing with the Dawn Father himself, and he gives the generic bland bullshit answers of, it's for the greater good. She even asks if he's worth saving, and he storms off like a petulant two-year-old. The party are also enamored by Prism's talking book, and Imogen and Frida are pretty sure that Daenerys is some kind of nefarious. After a lot of recapping with each other, Deanna decides to scry on Keyleth, but the magic is withheld for a moment. It seems the Dawnfather will remember her questioning, but our favorite redhead druid is alive, but gravely injured. She was luckily able to make it back home to Zephra, but her cuts and wounds aren't healing. There's no blood, but they're not closing, and I think they made sure that if she dies, she's permanently gone. Just like they did with Orem's family in Estros. Which means she's probably not going to be returning to help out in this fight against lewdness. I think Bell's Hells may have to die trying to stop what's happening with the moon. The scry ends as Keyleth traces a hand over a raven's feather and is helped up and out of her room. The party decide to split, the original members of Bell's Hells planning to march down to the excavation site with the soldiers, while the other three guests do some research to try and help them stop what's going on. Imogen hands over her letter from the Starpoint Conservatory gifted to her by Estros for Prism to disguise herself as the Violet Witch and gain access to the books there. FCG debates for a while on whether they should stay with their new lover and ends up calling a sort of truce with Prism to make sure that they're protected. In exchange of Frida's safety, Prism wants letters to protect Orem, who was apparently now her best friend, which Latna and Ashton take offense to. She also gives FCG a cigarette. With that, the party splits and say their goodbyes. Deanna tells Chetney she loves him and puts a death ward on him and Fern. Imogen tells Frida that she'll miss them and that they're one of the best people she's ever met. Frida then says goodbye to Letters, kissing him and asking him not to smoke. It's unattractive. Then proceeds to take the cig and smoke as they walk away. Prism summons them a phantom steed and says goodbye to her friends. She gives Ashton some paper and a quill, knowing that they're trying to meditate, and that maybe writing would be a good way to help them relax, which I really like. I can just imagine Ashton being the first person to pin, we didn't start the fire in the Exandrian world. And when saying goodbye to her best friend, she casts enlarge on him and suddenly Orem is a 6'6 douche jock. I love it. This is one of those episodes that are just so enjoyable because of the chaos. And I think you should go watch it to be filled in on all the little callbacks and inside jokes. Liam also suggests that the trio use the name of the Lorsonists, and I loved that. So maybe it won't be the last time we see this trio. I loved this little guest section we had the last few months, but I'm excited to finally dig into the real meat and potatoes now that our gang is back together. Don't forget to like and subscribe and check out my other recaps of Campaign 3 on my channel or my music. Thank you so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Good day, my friends.